Uh, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon, and, and, and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden, and the people of Syria shall go into captivity and decur, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of, of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof, and I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and him that holdeth, him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon, and I will turn mine hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly covenant. But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, saith the Lord. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, it's good to be here tonight. It's good to be here in your house with your people, with your word, and with the Spirit of God bearing witness to the things that are said and done tonight. We're, we're, we're just so thankful that you love us, that you care for us, and that you gave us a book. And uh, Lord, as we study your book tonight, we're studying a, a book that, within the book that is rather obscure from the standpoint that it's one of the smaller books. It's in the Old Testament. It's one that's often ignored, but yet it's a very important book because it's part of your word. And we ask God as we study the book of Amos that you give us enlightenment from your spirit. We pray, Father, that you give us wisdom, give us understanding, and Father, uh, help and guide and direct us as we take a look at some eternal truths found in the Word of God tonight. We pray your blessings upon us as we study it together, and we thank you, God, for loving us and caring for us and just being our God tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. All right, book of Amos, Amos chapter 1. If you will allow me to, I am going to take this thing off because I am all, already sweating like crazy. And, uh, and I know you're not warm, but I am. I'm always warm, I'm always hot. Uh, all right. Uh, Amos means burden bearer. And uh, Amos was not a, how do we say this, uh, not a full-time uh, prophet, not a full-time pastor per se, uh, not a full-time preacher. Uh, he was called out from what he was doing in order to deliver a message. And basically, this was it. And, you know, you don't hear much about Amos other than the book of Amos itself. But again, his name has significance because it means, means burden bearer. Well, he had a burden that he had to bear. He not only uh, gave a message of judgment to Israel and uh, also to Judah, but he also, he also gave a, a message of judgment to some Gentile nations, as we're going to see tonight. Uh, he was, by, by trade, a herdsman and a caretaker of sycamore trees. Look in verse 1. It says, The words of Amos, 
who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of, of Uzziah, king of Judah. So he was a herdsman. He was a shepherd. But he was also a caretaker of sycamore trees. Look with me over in chapter 7. And glance down at verse 14. It says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. So, uh, he, you know, he, he, again, this was not his profession per se, but God called him for a specific task, for a specific duty, and he was more than willing to do that which God called him to do. He lived in Tekoa. Tekoa is about 11 miles away from Jerusalem. And uh, during the reign of, of Uzziah in Judah uh, and of Jeroboam II in Israel is when he preached. Now, when I say Judah in Israel, I say that because, because after Solomon, uh, Ju uh, Israel split. And it split into uh, Judah and then also the, the, uh, the other remaining tribes of, of Israel. And uh, they, had, they had two kings, they had two governments, uh, they, were, they, were totally, they were totally separate from each other. That is not the way that God had intended it to be, but because of rebellion and because of being stiff-necked and so forth, that's what, that's what took place. Uh, during the, during uh, the, the reign, uh, again, the, the, the reigns were the reign of uh, Uzziah in Judah and then Jeroboam II down, uh, down in Israel. Uh, both Judah and Israel were prosperous at the writing of this prophecy. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't under judgment yet. They weren't suffering. In fact, they were doing quite well. They were prosperous and they were secure at the time. The people were religious at this time, but they weren't right with God. Uh, is it possible to be religious and not be right with God? Oh, yeah, we see it all the time. Uh, no personal relationship. You know, one of the things I think that is so unique and so, so wonderful about Bible-believing Christianity is that it's not just a faith that you believe, but it's a person that you have a relationship with. You have a personal relationship with God. And, you know, I, I don't know that we use that, that terminology as much anymore as we used to back in the 60s and 70s when I got saved and started learning how to, how to serve the Lord. But, but I believe it's an important concept to never forget is that we have a personal faith and it's a personal relationship. The, the night that I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and, and uh, uh, Dave Corey uh, taught a lesson, I believe it was Sunday school, right? That she taught on the, do you remember what she taught in Sunday school? <laughs> <laughs> about, about all the things that happened when you got saved. And, uh, uh, you know, he, only, he didn't even hardly touch the hem of the garment that, that day. And he couldn't because there's so, so much to, to talk about. But uh, uh, I have looked at verses and, and, and uh, verse after verse after verse of various things that happened the moment I got saved. Now, when I, the night I got saved, I thought I just got saved. I thought that was it. But I got redeemed. I got sanctified. I, I was uh, uh, given a place in, uh, in, in, uh, in the heavens. Uh, I was uh, given a mansion. Uh, I was born again, and on and on and on it goes. Uh, and all of those things have personal implications. Uh, and it, salvation is a personal relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what had happened to these people is they just got religious and the, and the, but the, the, the individualism and the personal part of it uh, just went by the wayside. And they were religious, but they weren't right with God. And they were still in their sin. They didn't let it affect the way that they lived. And the sin was destroying the moral and religious foundation of, of uh, both Israel and of Judah. And make, things like making money was more important than doing right. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go to chapter 5. Ch 
chapter 5, look at verses uh, 11 through 15. Chapter 5, verse 11 says, For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, so they beat down the poor, and, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them, ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their, from their right. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious uh, un, unto the remnant of Joseph. And what he's saying, he's saying, saying listen, you've, you've used money for the wrong purposes. You've treated the poor terribly. Uh, you've tread, trodden them under your foot. And then he, says, then he says, you need to love the good and hate the evil. Well, it's obvious why he told them that. He told them that because they were doing just the opposite. They were loving the evil and hating the good. Do you see that in our society today? You see where, where sin and perversion is now being lifted up and anyone who calls it that now is now considered evil rather than good. Uh, and, and that's what was happening in the society. The, whole, the tables were getting turned. The whole thing was being turned around. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to cha chapter 8. Just go over a page or two. Chapter 8, look at verses 4 through 6. This continues with, in that same vein. It says, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. In other words, they're going to make a buck, but they're going to do so deceitfully. They're going to have false balances, and, and they, do, they don't care. They're, they're just going to go ahead, and they're, they're going to cheat. They're going to steal as long as you make a buck. Verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the, refuge of, uh, the refuse of the wheat. And the, the, the Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and everyone mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Now, again, understand that when this prophecy was given, things were going well. But he's talking about the fact that, listen, things are going to turn because you have been warned about your, your life and the way that you're living and the sin that you're involved in and you're not doing anything about it. Uh, at the time, there was, there was both peace with their neighbors. They, they were not at war in any way. And there was prosperity. Uh, prosperity and peace do not always mean that a person, uh, a group, or a nation is right with God just because there's prosperity. Uh, and in fact, that's that's the reason that's the reason why God said what He did in in uh, Psalm 37. Keep your finger here in Amos. In fact, go back to Amos one because we're going to go right back there. But go to Psalm 37. This is one of the Psalm 37 is one of my favorite psalms, and it's it's because I. Some of it is obviously because of the content, but the other part of it is that it was one of the first psalms I really got familiar with early in my Christian life. And, uh, and I really, my heart really got endeared to, to uh, Psalm 37. But look at the first two verses. And this is an admonition. He says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither is the green herb. Well, what's the obvious implication in verse 1 where he says, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. They must be doing well. Just because they're flourishing does not mean they're right. 
Just because they're flourishing doesn't mean that what they do and what they believe is good. Uh, it, it, you know, they, uh, you, can't, you can't go by that. And uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He goes on to say in verse 2, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. So that does not last forever. And uh, he, was, he was admonishing them that, you know, don't go by just what you see. Because what you, what you see is not always a fair picture of what's really going on in people's hearts. Amos was called to be a prophet while he was working as a, as a shepherd, as a herdsman, and as a farmer. Why is that? Because God doesn't call sluggards. God doesn't ask people who are doing nothing to do something for him. He, he looks for people that are busy. He looks for people that are working. You know, the Bible says in the, in the New Testament, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Uh, there's a real premium put on work in the, in the scriptures. And, and uh, God called him to, the, uh, to the, the office of a prophet for a short period of time just simply because he was already faithful with what he was doing. He was faithful with his sheep. He was faithful with his, with his sycamore trees. And God uses people who are already doing something. He uses workers. And, and most of the prophecies in this book, as, as Amos gives them, most of the prophecies are aimed at Israel. Now, I, I found uh, one of the sources I am using in studying for this study is uh, a book on the Minor Prophets by Brother David Cloud. He's the guy who authors the uh, Friday Church News Notes. And um, he has got an outline that uh, he has put together that is really good. I read through it and uh, really just, just got a blessing. It's just a, a quick you know, one sentence explanation of of passages all the way through, starting in verse 1, uh, actually starting in verse 2, of, uh, of Amos chapter 1, all the way down to the, the end of the book, which is Amos, Amos chapter 9. I want to read these to you, and as I read them, I want you to take some mental notes. In fact, if you've got a piece of paper and a pen, I want you to, I want you to jot some things down. Um, I want you to, to listen for, and I'll read it down, I'll read through the list twice. I want you to look for qualities of God that stick out. In other words, through this explanation of what's in, what's contained in the book of Amos, what, is the, what, are the, what does the book of Amos tell you? It, what is it going to tell us about God? Okay? You follow me on that? Okay, if you don't, maybe you will the second time through. <laughs> Let me get started. Amos 1, 2 through 2, 3. Prophecies against Israel's enemies. Chapter 2, verses 4, 4 and 5. Indictment of Judah. Uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Indictment of Israel. Amos 3, 1 through, through 8. God's further indictment of Israel. Amos 3, 9 through 15. Israel's oppression and God's judgment. Uh, Amos 4, 1 through 5, God's warning to the upper class women of Israel. Uh, Amos 4, 6 through 13, God describes his efforts to bring Israel to repentance. Amos 5, 1 through 3, God laments over Israel. Amos 5, 4 through 15, God beseeches Israel to repent. Amos 5, 10 through 13, God returns to his indictment of Israel. Amos 5, 14 and 15, God beseeches Israel to do right. Amos 5, 16 through 20, the day of the Lord. Amos 5, 21 through 27, God calls for righteousness and warns of judgment. Amos 6, 1 through 6, God warns those who were at ease in Zion. Amos 6, 7 through 14, God pronounces judgment. Amos 7, 1 through 9, three visions of judgment. Amos 7, 10 through 17, the prophet's dealings with the priest of Bethel. Amos 8, 1 through 11, or excuse me, 1 through 3, the uh, basket of summer fruit. Amos 8, 4 through 10, God's approaching judgment on the oppressors. 
Amos 8, 11 through 14, the famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Amos 9, 1 through 10, God's judgment on Israel announced. And then the last one is Amos 9, 11 through 15, Israel's restoration. Now, as I read through it again, I'm just going to read the titles. I'm not going to read the references, all right? Prophecies against Israel's enemies, indictment of Judah, indictment of Israel, God's further indictment of Israel, Israel's oppression and God's judgment, God's warning to the upper class women of Israel, God's, uh, God describes his efforts to bring Israel to repentance, God laments over Israel, uh, God beseeches Israel to repent. God returns to his indictment of Israel. God beseeches Israel to do right. The day of the Lord. God calls for righteousness and warns of judgment. God warns those who are at ease in Zion. God pronounces judgment. Three visions of judgment. The, the prophet's dealings with the priest of Bethel. The basket of summer fruit. Uh, God's approaching judgment on the oppressors the famine of hearing the words of the Lord, God's judgment on Israel announced, and then last of all, Israel's restoration. All right? What, what qualities of God stick out when you hear those descriptions of those passages? Give me some qualities. Some qualities of God. Leah. Leah. Okay. He's not just, you know, and you say, and I know what you mean when you say that. He's not just a God of love, but he's a God of judgment. But a proper God of judgment is a God of love. Um, I remember years ago, there was, a, um, there was a book that was written about child discipline. And the book had a cover on it, and I'm not going to be able to do justice to the drawing, that's for sure, because I can't draw for nothing. But it had, it had uh, a balance scale. And things on each side of the scale. And on this side, it had the word love. And on this side, it had the word discipline. And I understand what the author was trying to get across. He was saying that, listen, you can say you have love, but if you don't discipline, it's not going to be balanced. But the truth of the matter is this. Discipline isn't the opposite of love. Discipline is love. It is love. Just like what Leah just said about God. Uh, he whom he loveth, he what? Chasteneth. <laughs> and, ooh, I don't like that next word. Scourgeth. That's kind of rough. Scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And so what, what God's saying is, is that if you really, if, you, if I properly love you, when you get on the line, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. And he loved them enough to go see them about it and confront them. Uh, you know, that really, that shows us something too. If, if, we, if we see somebody that's going wrong, you know, and we see somebody that's taken, that's, that's going in a direction that's harmful to them, and it's harmful to God. And, and, and we don't say anything. We don't try to help them. You know, do, do we really care for them? You know, and, and the, the, the truth is, uh, love acts. Love does something when, when something is wrong. And because something was wrong in Israel and Judah, God acted. He, he, he uh, went ahead and stepped in. Okay, what else? What else is, yeah, Titus. What does it tell us about God? Okay, he gives you time to repent. What do we call that? If he's, if he's waiting and giving us time, that means he's very forgiving. <laughs> okay, he is. He's forgiving and he starts with a P. Patient. Patient, thank you. <laughs> okay, he's very patient. Okay. Uh, and, and he, he wait now, again, he's patient to a point. And when it comes to that point, then he says, enough is enough. In fact, 
Um, one of the things I wanted to bring out to you, and we, we will as we go through it, uh, but if, if you look with me, let's see, go to verse 3 of chapter 1, and he uses this term in one form or another several times in this chapter. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Now, he's not talking about three literal transactions because, of, because you've gone past three and gone to four, I'm coming down like gangbusters. That isn't it. That's a saying that was used back then. And basically what it meant was you've gone too far. It didn't have anything to do with the actual literal numbers. It had to do with the fact that they have sinned beyond what he would be willing to be patient and wait for them to repent for. And the truth of the matter is, none of us know when that line is. And, and I don't believe it's the same with every individual because, again, God has a personal relationship with us. And just like parents treat uh, you know, it's funny. On one hand, you, you, you do your best to try to treat your kids equally. But on the other hand, you can't treat them equally. Because if you treat them equally, you treat them unjustly. And, and in this respect, that different kids have different strengths and different weaknesses, have different tendencies. And so you have to, you have to be aware of those things and treat them accordingly. There's, there's some there's some kids if you give them if you give them a little uh, uh, if you give them a lot of patience they'll trample all over your grace and your mercy. Uh, there's others that as soon as you give them just a, a little bit of of grace or mercy they immediately repent to, and get the thing right. You know you've got to you've got to treat uh, you, them according to the way that they respond to those things. Okay, that's good. What's another one? Yes, sir, Michael. Okay, he's not joyful over the fact that they've strayed from him, is he? No, no, he's sad. And why is he sad, Michael? It's because Israel was on a roller coaster from loving God to worshiping other gods. Yeah, yeah, they went back and forth. And did that hurt God? Yeah, it did. Not only did it hurt God, but did it also hurt Israel? Did it hurt Israel? Sure it did. Sure it did. Because they, they, they lost the blessings that God had for them. Okay, good. What's another one? What's another one you picked up out of there? There was a whole bunch. Any others? Yeah. That's good. In the New Testament, that's called uh, the fact that God is not a respecter of persons, right? He doesn't, re he doesn't respect one group over another group. Hey, he didn't care whether the women were of, of uh, high society. He still needed to talk to them. He didn't care whether it was Judah or it was Israel. He had to talk to them. He didn't care if they were heathen or they were not. He had to talk to them. He had to approach them. He had to confront them. That's good. That's excellent. Okay, what else? Any others? Okay, let me give you some of the ones that I picked. Um, he was protective. He's, it shows his protection. He's very protective of Israel. Um, yes, he, he loved, it, loved Israel. He, yes, he was sad that they went into sin. But the reason why he was sad was because he wanted to protect them. He didn't want them to have to go through the judgment that they were about to go through. And the other thing about it, too, and he, we've all kind of alluded to this already, but he was very stern and plain in his rebuke. Uh, he didn't mince words. And, and it's, again, because he cared. The uh, Bible says over in the book of Proverbs, open rebuke is better than secret love. 
Uh, in other words, it, open rebuke is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Now, nobody likes to be rebuked. I know I don't like to be rebuked. Uh, but but uh, it's often necessary uh, for rebukes to come. And when they do come, it's good to know they come from somebody who cares. Uh, he, uh, he loved Israel not, even, not, not only when, you know, uh, Michael talked about the fact that Israel was on a constant roller coaster back and forth. When it love God, then it serve other gods, and love God, then serve other gods. But you know, no matter which state they were in, he still loved them. He didn't just love them when they loved him. He loved them even when they didn't love him. Um, he was consistent, and he was sure in his judgment. And uh, he, again, didn't, didn't hold anything back. And then, then last of all, and this, this goes to the, the, last, uh, the last thing that I read, was about the restoration of Israel. Did you ever notice how often, even in the middle of rebuke, even in the middle of speaking of judgment, even in the middle of talking about the, you know, the wage, like, like, like the verse, the wages of sin is death. That's an awful verse. You say, you say, what do you mean an awful verse? Well, it tells you what sin, it's awful because of what it says. Uh, the wages of sin is death. That's, that's a terrible thing. But it always is true. Aren't you glad that that isn't all he said in the verse? <laughs> Aren't you glad he didn't just say the wages of sin is death, period? No. He said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, you know, he's very forward and very plain and very black and white when it comes to the judgment. But he's also always offering hope and always offering a cure. And, and that's our God. That's exactly what he does. Okay, uh, we really haven't started the, the text per se. And I think I'm, what I'm going to do is I've already gone 30 minutes and I wanted to keep it at 30 minutes for my sake and for your sake, both, uh, tonight. And uh, next week, again, we won't have a regular service, but we'll have a service a, a week from, a, a two weeks from tonight. And uh, we'll, we'll continue, we'll actually get into the text and begin. And if you haven't already, just for yourself, read Amos chapter 1. Let me encourage you in the next two weeks to read it. And, and, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a, a preview a little bit of what, what's going on. He, he talks to some nations in, in uh, chapter 1 and then he talks to one nation in chapter, in chapter 2, it's a total of six nations. They're Gentile nations. And he talks to the Gentiles first. And he lets them know about the judgment that's coming. And it, the judgment's coming because of two things. Number one, their relationship or lack thereof with God. But then also, number two, the way that they've treated Israel. And uh, because God made a, a promise that he would bless those that blessed Israel, and he would curse those that cursed Israel, and he's kept that promise even to this very day. All right, get out your prayer list, if you would, tonight. And let me give you... One to add to it. I got, uh, most of you know who Jacqueline is, Jackie. She, um, she uh, uh, texted me earlier today. And she said last night she started to have some, some things going on with her body that, that just has never happened before. And this is what she said. She said she felt a crawling sensation on the right side of my skull. Now, there was nothing crawling on her skull, okay? She didn't have spiders or anything like that. But she said it felt like this, she did. And, and uh, there were other things that were going on. She has been diagnosed with the possibility uh, of, of having lupus. 
And uh, from what I've heard in the past of folks that have had lupus, these kind of things do happen, different kinds of feelings and so forth. And uh, she was, the reason why she's not here tonight, and she's been extremely faithful to the service, it's been a blessing to watch it um, since she's been back from New York City. But uh, she uh, is having it checked out. In fact, she, was, she had an appointment up in Syracuse at 6.30 tonight. So put Jackie, if you would. I'm not, probably not going to say this right. Is it Deregis? Did I get it right? Deregis? Okay. D-E-R-E-G-I-S. D-E-R-E-G-I-S. Jackie Deregis. And then I would, I would appreciate uh, prayers on my behalf. Uh, I just found out uh, yesterday that uh, one of the blood tests that came back said that there is a possibility uh, that I have some blood clots going on. They checked for blood clots in the chest, and there aren't any. And all God's people said. <laughs> At least God's preacher says amen. Uh, so there's none in the chest. And, uh, but there might be some in my legs, and they have to schedule, have to schedule a, uh, 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 an ultrasound to check my legs, and they, they didn't do it today, so I'm hoping that they're going to do that tomorrow. But pray that, uh, that number one, uh, that uh, they would be able to see clearly what's going on and to find out there was a, there was a, a test that came back, came back really high. It's called a, a D-dimer, D-dimer test. I don't, I've never heard of it before. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was high, and it was, uh, in fact, they, it sounded like it was very, very high. Uh, so that's saying that there's something going on, and they don't know as of right now what that something is. So I would appreciate your prayers on that. And then also to pray for, obviously, our, our uh, uh, time with Brother Gip next week. And uh, I'm looking forward to good meetings. I'm sure, sure that'll be a good time. And uh, then also for the evening of gratitude in particular, uh, pray for, for, for those that you've invited personally, then pray for those that, uh, that uh, uh, will be inviting others, and uh, pray, for, pray for lost people that will be coming that night. We're going to have a nice gift for them. We're going to have a nice reception afterwards. We're going to ask you folks to... Uh, stand up and introduce your guests, and they're not going to have to say anything, but we'll put you a little bit on the spot and uh, let you tell us why you're thankful for those people. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a really, really good service and be an opportunity for us to, to have some visitors and have some folks under the sound of the gospel that uh, would not necessarily normally uh, hear the word of God. So, uh, so be in prayer for those things if you would. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask just one of our men to pray and, and to bring up these requests and other ones that are on the list and ones that are, are on your heart, and uh, then we'll be dismissed when he's done praying. So, Dan, Corey, you're the guy, okay? So, would, would you... <laughs> yeah, you, Dan. <laughs> you have to forgive Dan. He's, he's working a lot of double shifts. <laughs> So sometimes it doesn't, uh, doesn't, it doesn't hit or go through the first time around. <clears throat> and I understand. Been like that for the last five weeks. So, <laughs> Dan, come pray for us. Let me, let me give you this. <clears throat> 